As you know, the uh, Troika mission has uh, concluded what it had to conclude. That's good uh, news for Greece and that's uh, good news for uh, the Euro area. I was discussing with the uh, Prime Minister the uh, fiscal targets of uh, Greece, the structural reforms which have to be undertaken by Greece. And we were, of course, discussing the privatization uh, issue. On that basis, I expect the Eurogroup to agree to additional financing to be provided uh, to Greece under, of course, strict uh, conditionality. We have seen a growing lack of faith in our governance structures. We're seeing the cohesion undermined, economic cohesion, political cohesion, and social cohesion. And it's a challenge, which is not just for the future of Europe, but for the existence of Europe. started in 2008, nobody could foresee what would happen and how bad it would be. We were listening, we could hear from here and there that the Americans had this kind of problem, that kind of problem. Our government said, you know, we are okay. The Greeks lived in a myth of uh, prosperity and uh, well-being and everything. And all of a sudden everything collapsed. And it was so quick that people had not the time to really organize their lives. It was like a, a horrible nightmare, all of a sudden. Greece today is in a state of absolute collapse at all levels, financially, socially and politically. The country is facing the seventh year of a deep recession. At the same time, the Greek state is struggling with a huge public debt. In order to pay back the lenders, the Troika, consisting of the European Union Commission, the European Central Bank and the International Monetary Fund, has granted the Greek government several bailout packages. But this money comes at a high price. The government had assigned two memoranda which gave the green light to raise taxes, introduce mass layoffs in the public sector, increase the retirement age to 67 and carry out a privatisation programme of public assets, among other things. Politicians and the media are talking about the salvation of the Greek people from the threat of bankruptcy and the guarantee of the wages and pensions of the Greek people. But reality is showing the opposite. The official jobless rate hit a new record high of almost 28% in June 2013. Everyone can feel that the, the real unemployment in the, is more than 35%. But the shocking figure is that the, amongst the youth, the unemployment is more than 60%. Indeed, for those aged 15 to 24, the jobless rate registered a staggering 65% in May 2013. So almost two out of three young people are out of work. In the last six years alone, one million jobs have been destroyed. But even those who are still employed have to bear a massive reduction in their wages. You see a, an advertisement in the newspaper for a job that calls for somebody with a master's degree in this or that and this or highly qualified people. And you go there and they say it's something like uh, uh, 450 euro per month. And you go there and you find another 
200 people waiting for the same job. And then one of them goes out and says, you know, one of the people of the, of the company, and say, okay, the job will be paid 150, whoever wants it, you may stay, the others go away. I mean, they will create an army of unemployed youths, and not only young people, so they can come and find cheap labor like they do in Afghanistan or in Malaysia. And, and that's what their plan is for the whole of Southern Europe. That's the idea. Such low wages are not limited to some dodgy entrepreneurs in the black market. The State Employment Agency, OAED, offers a program for temporary jobs. Workers in these five-month positions at municipal and regional authorities earn less than 500 euros. Almost every one or two months, we have new cuts in wages, we have new taxes, and uh, it is uh, cal calculated that uh, uh, the, the ability of Greek people to consume has fallen for more than 50% uh, in the last uh, five years. Four million Greeks, in a population of 11 million, live below the poverty line and almost half a million families have no monthly income at all. The number of people who live without electricity is about 300,000. We have, of course, we have people starving. We have children who cannot be vaccinated. We have people who, um, who do not have electricity or water supply in their houses anymore. Electricity bills and the water and for water. They have all gone up. Everything is getting more expensive while the wages fall. It's, it, it is dramatic. I mean, you can't say. Try to imagine the most dramatic thing. Try to imagine. And that's Greece right now. Actually, what, what I've seen is uh, uh, gentlemen with suits, you know, very well, young people going through the garbage to find or, you know, trying to find oil um, tins, tin cans, to sell as metals, as scrap metal. We have, we have a, a huge explosion of uh, homelessness, of homeless people. You can see from the faces that some years ago they were just ordinary people. And this is a very shocking feeling uh, for, 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 for the Greek society. According to estimates, there are now over 20,000 homeless people all over Greece, although the real figure could be much higher. We started seeing friends who lost their jobs and they ended up in, in uh, you know, kitchen soups, cuisine in, on the street to, to find food and they couldn't pay their rent and they couldn't pay their uh, loans they had in the bank. And people started getting poorer and poorer, and of course started getting angrier and angrier as the time went by. So in my neighborhood, in order to help the people from going down in the garbage bin and searching for their own food, they put the bags with the food uh, on top of the garbage bin with a note that the, with a note for the municipal workers, please do not throw its food for poor. But even for people who still have a roof over their head, the austerity measures make it difficult to have anything like a decent life. The government uh, applied a, a very, a very serious uh, uh, tax in the oil of heating. During the winter there was this phenomenon which, which was very, very interesting and at the same time very shocking, that people used to buy stoves for wood, uh, and uh, they used to buy wood, or they used to cut chairs. <coughs> they were trying to find wood everywhere in order to, to burn wood, to get warm inside inside their apartments. Poor people started chopping off trees of the roads, and in order to put to the fireplaces to warm themselves. And what they also did is um, dis not destroy, but actually cut off um, window doors made out of wood in order to provide some, uh, themselves with some cheap logs to put to the fireplace. But to see how the crisis um, also translates into environmental problems, because of the people burning uh, 
all kinds of wood in their fireplaces, we had a huge problem with uh, the, the fog, the smoke. So during the winter when it was very cold, you would step out of your house and you couldn't breathe because there was a thick layer of yellowish fog uh, and many people with problems like asthma couldn't go out. And this situation brings Greek people back decades, not only years, it brings people decades uh, back. Uh, that was the situation uh, during the 40s. This is not the only aspect that reminds people of the intolerable times Greeks had to live through during the Second World War and the period afterwards. You know, orphanages now uh, are not mostly filled with people, with uh, children that do not have parents, but they have, uh, they host children that their parents cannot provide them with food. So what they do is, the, the unemployed uh, parents, leave their children for five days to the orphanage and then come back and take them for the weekend. And that happens if they have gained enough money to, to provide them to feed the children. The situation is so bad that it not only threatens the life people were used to, but threatens their lives as well. The median life expectancy has fallen by two or three years, which is horrible. In peace, it's not a war, but it's still like a war. People jump off the balconies, commit suicide, and they commit. The, the, you see this suicide that is like a, a very... They commit suicide in a revolutionary way. They do it so you know. They don't just it, take a drug and wait to die peacefully at home, they jump off the window, they jump off the balcony, they shoot themselves in front of you, they hang themselves in their houses, very dramatically, very theatrical in a way. In 2009, Greece had the lowest ratio for suicide in the OECD group of industrialized countries. But according to official data, the suicide rate has doubled since then. There are now, on average, about 70 suicides or attempted suicides every month. So all this, all this uh, monstrosity of barbarism, where people's life don't mean a thing. They don't mean a thing. They, they just squeeze you down like worms, like nothing. And the more they squeeze you down, the more you lie down and, and expect them to, to squeeze you, you know? This is something I will never understand. It is not only the private sector that is witnessing a wave of layoffs. The workers in the public sector are being laid off in the tens of thousands. A total of 150,000 government jobs will have been cut by 2015. Whenever the system wanted to hit a group of people, they started by um, saying bad things about them. Let's say the uh, working, working people of the public sector. They started, you know, just saying how lazy they were and how they, they didn't like their job and how they had got their jobs through strange ways of uh, political, uh, you know, favors and stuff. And whenever they started to hit one group, you knew that there was coming, something was coming against this group. So they brought one group uh, against the other the farmers and then the workers and then the people working in the in the in, in a specific industry and then uh, the doctors and then and you knew it and that was a huge problem because until now their propaganda is still going on that you know which is the neoliberal the um, milton friedman doctrine you should 
get rid of the social state, whatever it is, and cut jobs and uh, prevent uh, all, uh, throw down the drain every working uh, law or rule that has been achieved. Just before the start of the new term at university at the end of September 2013, the government announced the overnight removal of almost two in five administrative personnel from the University of Athens. This move drastically increased the ratio of non-teaching staff to students. The University Senate announced that it was objectively impossible to maintain its operations because of the layoffs. Seven more universities around the country have also announced a suspension of all activity. Just imagine the tens of thousands of students being told basically a few days before the planned start of their academic year that they are being forced into idleness for at least a term. The higher education system is sacrificed in order to plug the budget deficit. The healthcare sector has also seen severe cuts. Many hospitals are now without proper medicine or have had to close their doors forever. A third of the population has no medical insurance and therefore no access to medical services. They kick people out of hospitals because they don't have to pay. This is something I never thought I would see in my country. When I lived in the States, and I, I knew it because I was working in a hospital, I said, thank God, you know, in Europe or in Greece, we are never like this. And when I was working in the hospital in Greece, there would be no way we had Bosnian refugees from the war coming and people and children with leukemia and they would need a transplant and they would get a bone marrow transplant for free because it's, the state would pay. And I was proud that we were like this. On this level, you know, and I'm not talking political, I was never proud. But on this level, at least, of, of social services to people. And all of a sudden they kick out, you can't go and have a baby in a maternity clinic because if, if you're not, if, you're, if you don't work, if you don't have a job and you don't have a, a social security, you can't pay, so you don't go. Or you go for a day and they kick you out and you get your belly and leave the hospital. As you can imagine, this whole situation is a great shock to the population. However, many have started to organise themselves in order to absorb the worst consequences and are now providing services which the state is not able to provide anymore. There are now many solidarity clinics which provide free services for people in need with doctors, nurses, therapists working on a voluntary basis. In the Clinic of Solidarity in Thessaloniki, for example, up to 100 people daily make use of the services. Without such projects, people will be in serious trouble as the public health care sector is deteriorating rapidly. Apart from these clinics, there are some other examples of people starting to organize themselves in neighborhood committees and solidarity networks. They try to, to give away free food or very cheap to families they need it. Or uh, they offer medical advice or medical support in organized groups. For example, in my group, we have movies every now and then and we organize talks that really get people together and talk about the history of the crisis or the politics of the crisis. So, and you try to get them involved in, the, in, in whatever needs to be done against the crisis and organize themselves. In another example, journalists have created their own newspaper and run it as a cooperative. We went to the office of Ephimerida Ton Syntacton and asked Nicolas Vouledis about the history of their project. It began uh, last, uh, last year after the closure of Eleftherotypia. Eleftherotypia was a very good uh, and leading newspaper for around 30 years in Greece. Some of the journalists began uh, in the summer of uh, 2012 discussing ways to publish a newspaper, a new paper, but without an editor, without a proprietor, without a magnate, a kind of cooperative newspaper. A real professional paper published every day with a circulation all over Greece. And this is the meaning is 
the, the journalist journal. We have a circulation more than 8,000 all over Greece, sometimes around nine. That is a very good circulation for a new newspaper without money, without support, political or economic support from any body, I mean political parties, the government or companies, big companies. The only money is coming from the paper and from the advertisement. We want to keep our independence and this is the, the, the essence of our line. Of course, we are against the government of uh, PASOKA New Democracy, but we are publishing some articles from members, from cadres of PASOK, uh, interviews from uh, government uh, ministers or uh, deputies, but mainly from the center-left to the left area. The only uh, front, <laughs> it is against the extreme right. This is the only front. The decisions of uh, economic or uh, administrative matters is a problem of the cooperative or the company, because the cooperative uh, has uh, founded a, a company to run the, the paper. But on the editorial, the stuff, the meaning, the, the, the text, this is a decision of the director and the meeting of the editors-in-chief. We are gathering here, we are discussing the main themes of the paper, and we are deciding with a consensus what will be the first item, what will be the title, and so on. This is an experiment, and this is a product of the crisis. And in, in, in a way, we are trying and we want to, to contribute to overcoming the crisis. Of course, not by <laughs> assuming uh, the power, but writing, criticizing, contributing to the new, uh, um, the, to the emergence of new powers, of new organizations and new, and new parties. In Greece today, we can see many experiments in the emergence of workers' control in several companies. Viome, for example, is a building materials factory in Thessaloniki, which was abandoned by its owner and the workers have been unpaid since May 2011. The workers organized the General Assembly of the Workers and decided to occupy the factory and operate it under direct democratic workers' control. After a year-long struggle that has attracted attention and solidarity in Greece and worldwide, they kick-started production without a boss in February 2013. Another huge shock the Greek people have experienced was in June 2013, when from one day to the other, the Samaras government announced the closure of the public broadcaster ERT as part of a bid to meet the bailout obligations. Basically, without any prior discussion, the government passed an unprecedented decree, which meant that the historic state television and radio had to cease transmitting. This includes five state TV channels, 29 radio stations around Greece, and also means the loss of around 2,700 jobs. This measure sparked a huge movement against the closure of ERT and in solidarity with the workers at ERT. Furthermore, the closure prompted two general strikes, which hit government offices, schools, hospitals and public transport. We spoke to Lucas Panugias, who was a member of the ERT choir at the ERT headquarters in Athens. Αυτό το κλείσιμο της ΕΕ έγινε γιατί η πολιτική μας ηγεσία είναι υποταγμένη στα συμφέροντα, είτε ελληνικά είναι αυτά, είτε ξένα συμφέροντα, είναι απόλυτα υποταγμένη. Ακολουθώντας λοιπόν τις οδηγίες που τους δώσανε, αποφάσισαν ξαφνικά να πρωτοτυπήσουν παγκόσμια και να κλείσουν τη δημόσια βιβλιοτηλεόραση της Ελλάδας. Government propaganda is trying to persuade Greek people that they have closed down a debt-ridden organization. Let's see how debt-ridden ERT really was. In 2011, ERT made a profit of 57 million euros. After paying 83 million euros in taxes, 26 million euros in VAT payments, 33 million euros in national insurance payments and 24 million euros in other tax payments. 
In 2012, ERT contributed another 84 million euros in taxes. In the first five months of 2013, ERT's budget had a surplus of 40 million euros. Σκέφτονται να κλείσουν του περιφερειακού σταθμού αν ξανανοίξει αυτό το νέο σχήμα. Πιθανό να μην έχουμε περιφερειακού σταθμού. Έχω ένα απλό παράδειγμα να σα πω για τη Ρόδο, όπου εν λειτουργία η ΕΡΤ έχει ένα πομπό των 10 kW στη Ρόδο, που απέναντι όμω στου πομπό των Τούρκων είναι 100 kW και πέφτει πάνω στη συχνότητα ή έπεφτε πάνω στη συχνότητα. Όταν σταμάτησε στη συχνότητα τη Ρόδου, έπεσε καθαρά επάνω τη και ακούνε μόνο τουρκικό ραδιόφωνο. Τα νησιά μα είναι αυτά που πλήττονται περισσότερο γιατί στην υπηρετική Ελλάδα αναλογικά μα εκπέμπουν τα φίλια μέσα, οι τοπικοί σταθμοί που εκπέμπουν ΕΡΤ. Όμω στα νησιά έχουμε πρόβλημα σοβαρό γιατί η πομπή των Τούρκων είναι πάρα πολύ δυνατή, όπω και η πομπή των Σκοπίων είναι δυνατή και πέφτουν πάνω στη Δυτική Μακεδονία. Και έτσι δεν μπορούν οι Έλληνε, οι ακρίτε μα, δεν μπορούν να έχουν επαφή με την ελληνική γνώμη εδώ πέρα, ό,τι συμβαίνει. But the journalists and the technicians of ERT did not just look on helplessly. They decided to occupy the facilities of the broadcasting company, protect the property and run the station by themselves. As it was not possible for them to broadcast via satellite, they started to transmit their militant program on the internet in digital format. And then the other thing that we could say is about how the ERT works as a process. Υπάρχουν <laughs> Το τελευταίο νομίζω τον έβαλε το Μάιο του 2013 και μετά από ένα μήνα έκλεισε την ΕΡΤ. Ουσιαστικά αυτό το ροσφέτη το είχε κάνει και φαίνεται θα το πούλησε αυτό που το έκανε: Ότι εγώ παιδιά σα έβαλα στην ΕΡΤ, αλλά η πολιτική άποψη ήταν ότι έπρεπε να κλείσουμε την ΕΡΤ. Σε αυτή την παγκόσμια πρωτοτυπία σίγουρα την πατήσαμε από την παγκόσμια κοινή γνώμη, από του ανθρώπου, του τρίτου φορεί που ήταν εμπλεκόμενοι με την ΕΡΤ, όπω είναι η UEFA, FIFA, EBU, όλοι αυτοί είχαν συμβόλαια με την ΕΡΤ και μπορούσαν αυτή τη στιγμή να ζητάνε τα διαφυγόντα κέρδη του και καλά θα κάνουν να τα ζητήσουν. Για να φανεί στο παγκόσμιο, στην παγκόσμια κοινή γνώμη, τι ζημιά προκάλεσαν αυτοί οι πρόχειροι σχεδιασμοί που κάνει αυτή η αστεία κυβέρνηση, η σημερινή. Διαφυλάττουμε τη δημόσια περιουσία γιατί είναι Άλιστα. λεφτά του ελληνικού λαού αυτά. Άλιστα. Δεν είναι λεφτά κανενό από αυτών, των πολιτικών, και έχουμε υποχρέωση απέναντι στον ελληνικό λαό να τα διαφυλάξουμε. In a blow against culture, the closure of ERT does not only affect the TV and radio channels, but also the ERT orchestra. And the ERT choir. Κλείσανε λοιπόν να αποφάσισα να κλείσω τα μουσικά σύνολα διαβάλλοντα τα από, ε, από το στόμα επίσημα, από τα επίσημα χείλη του κυβερνητικού εκπροσώπου Σίμου και Δίκογλου. <coughs> Είναι αυτό που το 2010 ερχόταν στι πορείε μαζί μα κατά τη πολιτική του Πασόκ. Βρίζοντα λοιπόν την πολιτική του Πασόκ που ήθελε να κλείσει την ΕΤΕΝΑ μόνο και τη ραδιοτηλεόραση. Αυτό λοιπόν ο ίδιο άνθρωπο που τον σώσαμε από τα χέρια των ΜΑΤ σε μια πορεία που είχαμε το 2010. Είναι ο ίδιο άνθρωπο που βγήκε και έκανε το διάγγελμα του κλεισίματο τη ΕΡΤ. Έκλεισε λοιπόν όλε τι δραστηριότητε τη ΕΡΤ, ε, λέγοντα ότι τα μουσικά σύνολα δεν θα ξαναυπάρξουν ποτέ. Τα μουσικά σύνολα δεν τα κλείσαν οι Γερμανοί, όμω το, 1940... το 1940 εδώ στην Ελλάδα δεν έκλεισαν την Εθνική Συμφωνική Ορχήστρα που από τότε υπήρχε. Και η τρικομματική αυτή κυβέρνηση το 2013 έκλεισε την ΕΡΤ και τι δράσει τη όλε. Ε, δεν υπάρχει λοιπόν κάποιο σχέδιο για μα. Έχουμε μία συμπαράσταση από όλο τον κόσμο. Έχουμε λάβει επιστολές και βίντεο από το Ισραήλ, από τα ευρωπαϊκά παρόμοια, από τις ευρωπαϊκές ραδιοφωνίες τηλεοράσεις που έχουν μουσικά σύνολα και λένε δεν μπορεί να συμβεί αυτό, αυτό είναι χτύπημα στον πολιτισμό. We were lucky enough to take part in a rehearsal of the orchestra, which later that evening had played at a public solidarity event outside the headquarters.
In the end, after workers had kept broadcasting live for five months, riot police raided the headquarters. In the dead of night, they stormed the building using tear gas to gain entry. The police formed a cordon round the building before going from room to room to evacuate protesters. They arrested those who refused to go. The sudden closure of a 75-year-old institution is seen by many Greeks as an attack on democracy. The way the state and the police forces are behaving brings back memories of the military dictatorship of the 60s and 70s. However, all those examples show that workers themselves can run a company, a hospital, a newspaper and even a TV channel by themselves. There's no need for a capitalist owner to decide. The workers themselves know very well what needs to be done in the production process or in running a hospital. This surely illustrates the way forward to a future society. However, at the same time it also shows the limits those experiments are facing while remaining in a capitalist environment. While a company under workers' control is able to democratically decide everything inside the factory, it is forced to operate as a cooperative according to the laws of the market. That means that it is still necessary for them to make a profit to keep the company going. Over the past decade, we have often seen a number of problems arising from this, as for example in Venezuela. It is very difficult for islands of workers' control to survive in a great sea of capitalism. And as we have seen with the example of ERT, the capitalist state is not keen in tolerating for any length of time something that could be a model for other workers to follow. Nevertheless, some journalists and technicians are still broadcasting on the internet from the former ERT facilities in Thessaloniki. In the last few years, Greek people have been out on the streets in countless demonstrations and occupations of squares, fighting against austerity measures. Actually, this movement, that was mainly in the Sidama Square, but in all the big uh, cities, city squares of Greece, uh, believed uh, that they could win. They were inspired by the big uh, revolutionary movement of the Arab world. Uh, there was an opinion poll that showed that uh, more from more from 60% of the people that were asked believed that this movement could win the government, that the government would not pass the uh, memorandum because it was massive. But of course, the government managed to pass uh, the memorandum. And they voted despite the small crisis they had. And uh, after this, there was a period of uh, disappointment uh, for ma many of the uh, working class and the youth uh, that uh, didn't last long. After this, we had very massive uh, working class uh, strikes, general strikes that were really different than the previous period. Uh, these general strikes had uh, massive support and they were they had massive uh, they were massive on the streets and there was a difference in the political slogans in the slogans they were political this time uh, not only you know fight for better wages fight for better pensions but down the government and uh, uh, one political solution and this was a very uh, different language the working class started to speak. Since the beginning of the crisis, workers have gone on several 24-hour and even 48-hour strikes, adding up to an incredible total number of around 30 strike days. While in many other countries a general strike to counter cuts would be a big step forward, many in Greece believe that those general strikes have become a means not to change something fundamentally, but just to let off steam. While the workers and youth have fought many times in a courageous manner on the streets and have had to face heavy police repression, 
The trade union bureaucracy is turning away from a major confrontation with the government. There has to be a perspective for them. They can uh, have a, a strike, a fight like this, uh, forever without a specific target. During the massive movement in solidarity with the occupation of the state broadcasting station ERT, the mood for more radical measures was ripe. This should be a call for an indefinite general strike, uh, because there was this huge support from, from the people, and uh, many trade union many trade union leaders and whole confederations uh, have supported the idea of a indefinite general strike. But there's a, the, the general confederation uh, that did not such a thing. It did not call for general strike. Nowadays, the working class is the absolute majority in Greek society. And by workers, we not only mean blue-collar workers operating on the factory floor, but also white-collar workers in an office, for example. That includes everyone who subsists on a wage, or, in Marx's terms, everyone who has to sell his or her labour power to a member of the capitalist class. And although workers are the ones producing almost all the wealth in the economy, they are the ones who have to bear the brunt when things get worse. One way for workers to defend their rights is a strike or a general strike. So just imagine an indefinite all-out general strike. Not a light bulb shines, not a telephone rings, not a wheel turns when workers all over the country down tools. In this way, one could also see who holds real power in their hands. But once the country grinds to halt in an all-out general strike, the focus would shift from the purely economic level to the political level. As I said, they said that we must now have a, a political solution. There must be a change of power. And uh, this is a revolutionary element in the situation, which expressed itself in the vote, massive vote for Syriza and the collapse of the PASOK uh, party. In the elections of June 2012, the Social Democratic Party PASOK, after having been the largest party in the outgoing coalition government, saw an unprecedented electoral collapse by 30 percentage points to just around 13%. This was due to the fact that the leadership of that party betrayed its own party base by carrying out austerity measures. The left coalition of Syriza, on the other hand, increased its share from not even 5% in the June 2009 elections to almost 27%. So there was a big swing of the working class to, to Syriza. Uh, the working class now believes that wants Syriza to become its tool uh, to change things, uh, to express itself in power. Uh, of course, Syriza didn't win for uh, only a few thousand votes, and this puts us in a new period of uh, disappointment, but a totally new one. Now, the working class have no uh, illusions about the government. They know it's going to attack them hard. Uh, they know it's weak. It's a three-party government uh, that could collapse any time. The Conservative Party New Democracy was the largest party after the elections. However, it only managed to piece together a coalition because of the bonus of 50 MPs that the party coming first gets on top of the MPs it got in the elections. The collapse almost came true, as the DEMA party resigned from the government because of the decision by the Prime Minister Samaras to close the public broadcaster ERT. That leaves only two parties, New Democracy and PASOK, in an unstable government. Despite the vicious campaign against Syriza in national and international media outlets, Syriza and its leader Alexis Tsipras were the biggest winners in these elections and came second. With the organisation of popular assemblies to mobilise the people for the electoral struggle, the slogan of the left government and a programme based on the rejection of the austerity measures, Syriza quickly gained the confidence of millions and became the main workers' party. 
Syriza also got the biggest share of votes among young voters. Since then, there were huge pressures uh, against, uh, against Syriza. So there's a, a tendency from big parts of the leadership to, to succumb to these pressures or to, to make steps backwards. And uh, in return, this, uh, this creates a disappointment to the people who voted uh, for Syriza, for the cancellation of the memorandum, for the deletion of the debt, the cancellation of the debt, for the, uh, the slogan of the left government. Now they see small steps, one after another, uh, backwards. From the, from the Syriza leadership and they get uh, disappointed, especially the younger layers. The main problem with the Syriza program is that it believes that capitalism can uh, become friendly to the working class and uh, that uh, all, of, all the crisis is just uh, misunderstanding that can be a result of Keynesianism and uh, Keynesian policies. This misunderstanding that a solution can be found within the limits of this system and the pressure from the Greek and the international bourgeoisie is precisely the reason why the Syriza leadership is trying to tune down the programme of the party instead of insisting on the slogan of a left government which would mean a united front with the communist party KKE they are now suggesting collaborating with the right-wing party independent Greeks. Tsipras, in a symbolic act, also met German Chancellor Merkel in Berlin and US President Obama in Washington. The leadership wants Syriza to be seen as a pragmatic alternative in order to renegotiate the terms of the memoranda. Syriza uh, has uh, a program uh, that it's, uh, it can't give any solution now to the basic problems of the working class because uh, it depends on some illusions. Uh, one of the main is that believes that the European Union, the capitalist, capitalist European Union, will keep uh, giving them money for them to do social uh, uh, policy, which is not going to, of course, to happen. Because if Greece starts uh, taking money from the European Union to give to the pensions and the workers, then this Spain will ask the same, uh, Portugal will ask the same. And German, the German bourgeoisie is not uh, ready to do such a thing. You don't have a, a mass turn of uh, people and youth and workers uh, to organize in, in Syria, to become members of Syria. Uh, it's still a, an electoral support. This is partly because they have become skeptical, having second thoughts about the intentions of uh, Syriza leadership. And this also uh, has again the, the, the effect that there's uh, less uh, pressure from the movement to Syriza leadership. However, Syriza is the leading party in the opinion polls and it is still the force that could change society. The communist tendency of Syriza believes there is a need for political and trade union militants to get organized inside Syriza and change the party's program from within, to bring it up to the task which is imposed by the situation Greek society is facing. The communist tendency of Syriza is uh, a tendency of uh, members of Syriza who support the, the need not to, to go back and uh, move away from the radical uh, slogans, but on the contrary, uh, the need to, to radicalize even more the program of the party, the slogans, its, uh, its uh, attitude during strike movements or other movements.
in order to come to a deeper understanding about what should be done about the crisis and what programme should be put forward, we first have to analyse the real cause of this crisis. Because in the last analysis, it is vital not to cure this and that problem of the crisis, but to pull up the root of the problem altogether. In London, we visited Alan Woods, editor of the In Defence of Marxism website. Alan has been following closely the worldwide economic crisis and also the political events in Greece over the past few years. You see, I, I know Greece quite well. I mean, I was in Greece, I've been travelling to Greece for many years. And I can tell you that just six, five or six years ago, the living standards in Athens, for example, were much different from the living standards here in London or any other European city. It seemed to be quite prosperous and people were well off and so on. And now it's collapsed with terrifying speed. So the question is, how can it happen that a country in Western Europe, where living standards just a few years ago have been comparable to that of other industrial nations, can experience such a collapse in a short period of time? This is the most serious, the deepest crisis, probably for 200 years. Even the uh, orthodox economists now admit it's the most serious crisis for 60 years. That is to say, the most serious crisis since the Great Depression of the 1930s. But I, I think it's far deeper than that. I don't think that there's ever been a crisis of these dimensions, perhaps in the history of, of capitalism. The immediate trigger for this crisis was the bursting of the housing bubble in the United States in 2007, which spread like a wildfire around the globe. But how can it be that the bursting of this speculative bubble in the US and the subprime mortgage crisis that followed caused the whole world economy to collapse like a house of cards, with catastrophic consequences in one country after another? Scratching the surface, we have to look deeper. We have to ask, not for the trigger, but the ultimate cause of the crisis. The uh, orthodox economists, the capitalist economists, have with the faintest idea. They can't even explain why the crisis exists. The nearest that they can come to some, call, uh, some kind of an explanation is that they describe the crisis as a, as a crisis of credit. Uh, a, credit a, a credit crunch is the expression in English. Now this, frankly, is an explanation which explains nothing. Marx dealt with that. You know, they used the same explanation in Marx's day. That is, a crises are caused by credit. Well, not so. Uh, the first thing one would have to ask uh, in, in dealing with this alleged explanation, a question which is never asked is, what is credit? You know, they never asked that. And all that credit is, Marx explained that a long time ago, all that credit is, it's a means whereby the capitalists, the bourgeois, can avoid a crisis of overproduction by expanding the market beyond its natural limits. You know, and credit has been expanded colossally into an unheard of extent in the last period. At the end of 2010, a staggering $52.6 trillion of credit was outstanding in the United States. In 1971, the ratio of total credit to the gross domestic product GDP, that is the value of all goods and services produced within the country, was 150%. In 2011, this expanded to 354%. In other words, credit has been growing much more rapidly than the economy for the past four decades. You see how they try to expand uh, the market, expand demand, in order to absorb the goods uh, and services which are being produced by artificial means. Now, of course, you know what happens when you get a credit card. There's a little bit of plastics that people, plastic that people carry around in their pockets. Marvelous thing, you know, a credit card. Marvelous thing, because with a credit card, you don't need any money. You can buy a car or a holiday in the Caribbean or perhaps even a house. I don't know. No money is required. It's wonderful. Yes, it's wonderful, but it's got one slight problem, which you may see what it is. Sooner or later, you have to pay this back. And furthermore, you have to pay it back with interest. In many countries like the US, the UK, Ireland and Spain, 
there had been a massive boom in house prices, particularly after the mild economic recession in the OECD countries of 2001. House prices had never risen so much and so fast. Cheap credit from the banks and mortgage lenders enabled homeowners to borrow hugely on the back of their house values. At one point, American homeowners were taking $1 trillion each year out of the value of their homes to spend. This fueled consumer spending and economic growth, as well as the stock market. But it was all based on a lie. No real values were being created. Indeed, US and British householders were saving nothing. Household saving rates had dropped from 13% of disposable income in the 1990s to negative rates in 2005. On the other hand, for example, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the huge mortgage insurers, had lent 50 times as much as their assets. The credit fueled economy was a huge bubble waiting to burst. And it did. Eventually, house prices got so high in the US that first-time buyers could no longer get on the housing ladder. They had been encouraged to buy homes with subprime mortgages, in effect loans that required no deposits, no proof of income and no initial payments for the first six months. These loans were cynically sold to people who very soon realised that they could not maintain the payments. Eventually, the housing bubble was pricked, leading to the collapse of summer 2007. It was then that the banks and other financial institutions realised they were in trouble. They had made these loans and had then packaged them up as bonds or securities to be sold and sold again around the world to all sorts of people. The risk of default on the mortgages was therefore spread around or diversified. In reality, it just meant that when the housing bubble burst, it affected not just mortgage lenders, but all sorts of investors, big and small. But according to the dominant economic theories put forward over the last few decades, this crisis should never have happened. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, in 1992 Francis Fukuyama famously put forward the idea of the end of history, by which he meant that capitalism had finally triumphed over communism. They put forward a theory called the efficient market hypothesis, which is supposed to be a new theory, of course, it's not new at all. It's, um, the old, it's a new version of what was known as Say's Law, which was around in Marx's day. And Marx answered that uh, particular idea at the time. The argument was that under capitalism, although well, we, we're not supposed to say capitalism now, you're supposed to say the free market economy. Sounds much nicer. The argument was that the market, if it's left to itself, will automatically regulate itself and that therefore it's not possible to have a crisis of overproduction as Marx predicted because supply and demand will, will balance each other out. Now this is false. There is no such automatic regulator in the market system. On the contrary, the capitalist system has an inbuilt central contradiction which is overproduction which whereby constantly Production oversuits the narrow limits of the market, and this is precisely what you have at the present time. In Greek mythology, there was a character called Procrustus who had a nasty habit of cutting off the legs, head and arms of his guests to make them fit into his infamous bed. Nowadays, the capitalist system resembles the bed of Procrustus. The bourgeoisie is systematically destroying the means of production in order to make them fit into the narrow limits of the capitalist system. I'll give you one example. Look, olive oil is very nice, it's very good for you. It's very tasty for food, you know. It's very good for your health. They're tearing up. It takes a long time to create an olive tree, by the way. It takes many, many years. They're tearing up the olive trees. Olive groves that have been there for hundreds of years in Spain. Why? Well, it's too much olive oil. How can there be too much olive oil? It's ridiculous. There's too much olive oil for the narrow limits of the capitalist system. That doesn't mean that there is no need for olives, olive oil or any other foodstuffs. Quite the opposite. Millions of people around the world are starving or malnourished. It just simply means that these olives 
or any other foodstuffs that cannot be sold for a satisfactory amount of money, are being destroyed. In the capitalist economy, the main incentive for producing, let's say, a car, is to make profit. A capitalist who owns a car factory hires workers to produce and assemble the different parts of a car. At the end of the day, the capitalist is interested in a higher return than the money he had invested in the beginning. Therefore, he has to sell these cars for a price which covers the investment in machinery, the cost of raw materials, the wages of the workers, and on top of all that, surplus value, which he extracts from the labour power of the workers. But not everyone who needs a car has enough money to buy one. Demand is limited. Our capitalist might be just fine if he were on his own, but there are many other car companies who all compete against each other. Our capitalist, therefore, has to invest in new machinery to outcompete the other producers. In this way, he can gain a temporary advantage and he needs fewer workers and is able to produce more cheaply. But he can still sell his cars at the same or slightly cheaper price than all the other producers. But sooner or later other industrialists follow suit and also invest in new machinery, because if they don't, they will no longer be competitive. This leads to a reduction in the socially necessary labour time for producing a car, and at the same time to a fall in the rate of profit. This process of production, investment and competition continues until the point is reached where there is an overproduction of cars which can no longer be sold. The automobile industry is, of course, a key industry because it entails all kinds of things. Beyond the automobile, beyond the production of cars and lorries and ambulances and trucks and bulldozers, it also involves steel, chemicals, plastics, paint, woodwork, you, you name it, all kinds of things are entailed. So, the, so lots of industries are dependent on the automobile sector. But at this moment in time, as I am speaking, the excess capacity, the global excess capacity on a world scale for the automobile industry is approximately 30%. Okay, one third. But what does this mean? Well, it means that Volkswagen, Fords, General Motors, Fiat, Citroën, you name it, all these companies, that could close one third of all of their factories tomorrow and sack all the workers. And they still would not be able to sell all the cars which they're able to produce at what they consider to be a, a suitable rate of profit. Not only are the different industries interdependent, but also the industries of different nations are closely intertwined. Similar figures for overproduction can be observed today in one industry after another, such as steel and shipping, and in one country after another. And with rising unemployment, the market shrinks even more as workers no longer have wages to buy commodities. One way of getting around the problem of overproduction was precisely the expansion of credit, so people could still buy a house, a car, a TV screen or other products. However, in contrast to the period before 2007, banks are now more reluctant to lend money to people who may not be able to pay back the loan. So are there other mechanisms for getting out of a crisis? First of all, you can uh, stimulate the economy by reducing the interest rate. Okay? That stimulates consumption and it increases the rate of profit and so on. The slight problem, however, that the, the rate of interest at the present time is near to zero. So how can you reduce that? You're going to have a negative rate of interest? That, that means the banks will pay me to take out a loan. I can't. I mean, the bankers are maybe a bit crazy, but they're not that crazy. So that particular avenue is because they, they, they've used it up. The other means would be, by, would be by, by increasing state expenditure. The state could spend its way out of the crisis, you know. This is what the Keynesians are arguing. They continue to argue this. Yes, but that doesn't make sense, huh? Right? As the right-wing point out, as the monetarist point out, they've got huge deficits. So how can you increase state? You increase state expenditure, you're increasing indebtedness which is a colossal burden on the economy, and that's perfectly true. In other words, what I'm saying to you is that the mechanisms by which the bourgeoisie normally would get out of a crisis have already been used up. Another attempt is that of the US Federal Reserve by pumping liquidity into the economy. 
which is what they call quantitative easing, or in other words, printing money. First of all, so far this has been proven useless for increasing production. The capitalists borrow money at low rates of interest and use it to speculate on the stock markets. They either use it to take over other companies or to buy shares in their own companies in order to drive up the prices of these shares. But this is a policy subject to the law of diminishing returns. The effect is less and therefore even bigger quantities are needed to produce the same results. It resembles a drug addict who every time needs to pump a bigger dose into his system in order to get a high. Sooner or later, quantitative easing must end in an explosion of inflation. This in turn will lead to a sharp increase in interest rates and a new and even deeper slump. As soon as the Fed announced its intention to end quantitative easing, there were sharp falls on the stock markets all over the world. Now I'll make a prediction. Unless and until they can clear this colossal excess capacity, and unless and until they can get rid of this mountain of debt which is weighing like a milestone on demand, there is no solution to this crisis. We can't solve it. Uh, they argue that it's credit. Well, if that's the case, if it's credit that's the problem, then you could solve the problem quite easily by throwing money at it. And by God, they have thrown money at it. They've thrown trillions of dollars into the banks and so on, trying to get the banks to, to lend money, you know, to boost inve productive investment. The bankers argue, of course, they're doing okay, aren't they, the bankers? Everyone else is suffering as a result of this, but the bankers are continue to pocket their uh, exorbitant, obscene bonuses that people begin to notice. But let's, let's leave the question of the bonuses to one side. They're not lending. And as for industry, what's the point? I ask you, what's the point in investing in, 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 in creating new productive capacity when they can't sell the goods which they're producing at the moment? So therefore, this, this of course, is not the answer. Non-financial companies in the United States are sitting on a mountain of more than two trillion dollars in cash at hand. There are similar figures for European companies, who also have a cash hoard of two trillion euros. In Britain, the cash hoard of companies has been growing by 75 billion pounds annually since the crisis began. But this money is just not being invested. In theory, the purpose of making profit is to reinvest and hence give incentives to innovation and create jobs. Capitalism in this regard had a progressive role in its early days. However, nowadays the capitalist system has outlived its progressive role. Trillions of dollars and euros are hoarded and concentrated in a few hands, while on the other hand, millions are finding it difficult to make ends meet. In the uh, 90s and the 80s, well, vast profits were being made, obscene profits were being made, in this huge carnival of... Uh, or orgy of money-making. Now, I cannot remember, I don't know about you, but I cannot remember, a single occasion when at that time a banker would stand up and say, hey, look, look I'm making rather a lot of money. I think maybe we should give a little bit to the state, perhaps to, maybe to build a few hospitals or money for the old age pensioners. Can you remember a banker ever saying that? No, I can't remember that. I don't think a, 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 such a speech was ever made. However, what, what they used to say, the state must stay out, you know that? The state must not interfere with the economy, there must be no regulation. No, no, this was supposed to be an impediment against, uh, uh, you know, the market, against free enterprise and so on. Okay, so, as a result, you get this orgy of speculation. When it collapsed, as it inevitably uh, had to collapse, what did they say? They say, well, you know, we've made a loss too bad. You know, this is the market, this is free enterprise. Oh, no, no, no. Did they say the state must stay out? The government must, has got no role to play? They didn't say that at all. They went rushing to the state, to the government, with their hands outstretched, not asking for money, but demanding money. That's a criminal offence, you know, in this country, at least, to demand money with menaces. The attempt to save the banking system and big companies by injecting huge amounts of state money that is taxpayers' money, is one of the main factors behind the recent massive increase of state debt. In 2008, 
the Greek debt with 112.9% of GDP was already quite high. It jumped to 160.5% in the first quarter of 2013 due to the recession and bailouts and is forecasted to rise even more. Greece had to undergo a haircut, meaning a partial default in 2012, but still needed more cash in order not to default completely. The Greek government signed two memoranda of understanding with the Troika in order to receive rescue packages. But this is a euphemism. We are fooled into believing that the European Union, the European Central Bank and the IMF are helping the Greek people. Well, not so. Between March 2010 and June 2013, the Troika transferred a total of 23 instalments comprising 206.9 billion euros. 28% were used for the recapitalization of Greek banks and about 50% went straight to the creditors of the Greek state, which are mainly German, French and other banks, instead of letting the creditors bear the risk for which they had received high interest payments before. 0.43% went to the Greek share of the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism. About 22% went into the national budget or couldn't be definitely attributed anymore. But if you look closer, a big part of this particular share, or about 16% of the total money, was actually used for the payment of interest. Therefore, only about 6% of the tranches made its way into the national budget. In other words, a total of 94%, or 194.8 billion euros, of the so-called rescue package was used to help out not the Greek people, but the financial sector. And moreover, from the 12 billion euros that made it into the national budget, 10 billion were put into military spending. Only a really tiny fraction was used for wages and pensions. Now the European Union, the Germans have shown up, are pressurising the Greeks all the time, putting extreme pressure to cut and cut and cut. They said the Greeks are spending too much. Well, ask the Greeks whether they're spending too much. They haven't got any money to spend. Austerity meaning cut wages, cut pensions, cut um, uh, social services, cut money from, uh, from um, health or uh, education, cut, 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 cut. To be able to pay your debt. But once you, you get into this austerity uh, thing, then recession comes, backslashes, you know, to your face, and the, the product of, of the country, the GDP, falls immensely, so the debt rises and you never have money to pay back. The idea is cut money, learn to live, that's what they told us, that was another uh, another psychological experiment, you know, they, they use and they always do when the, the IMF comes in. They make you feel guilty that you are responsible for whatever happened. You Greeks were lazy, you, you had, you, your expenses were above whatever you gained, you know, so you have to be punished. And you sit in a corner and say, my God, I spent too much and I don't have to pay, now I have to suffer. And that, that became a common sense to everybody. They have enslaved us, they keep pouring loans and loans and loans that we'll never be able to, to pay back. And the, and the European people should know that, that we will never pay, get their loans back. And they should stop it and help us through this at least. Stop giving us money, we can't pay back. The Greek and European politicians are trying to assure us that the Troika program is successful, that there are signs of recovery and that people's hardships are finally paying off. But quite the opposite is true. It's made the crisis worse. The more you cut spending and slash public services and so on, and cut old age pensions and the rest, well, you're reducing demand, aren't you? You're increasing unemployment. All they've succeeded in doing for the last three years is push Greece over a precipice. Push Greece into a deep recession. But you see, if unemployment increases, work it out. 
Demand decreases. People are spending less. And taxation also decreases. Therefore, the deficit in Greece is not shrinking. As they end. On the contrary, the deficit will increase if they haven't got any tax revenue. Of course, the rich don't pay taxes. That's been exposed in Greece. There's a, it was a big scandal because uh, they've concealed the fact that the bankers and the ship, shipping magnates and the, tu the tourist millionaires and members of the government, both the, the ruling party and uh, the PASOK, have been uh, avoiding tax, paying tax, taxes. People know this. The total fall of the GDP from 2008 to 2013 accounts to 25%, from 240 billion euros to 180 billion euros. And although the declared aim of the Troika programme was the reduction of the public debt, it achieved precisely the opposite. You know, sometimes we say, uh, you made the, the, the plan was a mistake. No, it was not a mistake. The plan was very, very successful to get us to where we are now. That was the plan from the very beginning. It was not like we didn't get, we didn't, you know, um, reach the targets. The targets were not to be reached from the very beginning. It took us some time to realize that. The British Hellenic Chamber of Commerce warned that Greece risks becoming a failed state, threatening to destabilize its continental neighbours. This comes just at a time when Greece took over the EU presidency in January 2014. The question remains, why especially Greece and other southern European countries are facing this deep crisis as compared to a country like Germany, which is at the moment still better off and is the one dictating the terms of the Troika programme. The creation of the European Union was an attempt on part of the European bourgeoisie, mainly the French and Germans, to overcome the limitations of the nation-state by creating a common market which was supposed to lead to greater union. The introduction of a common currency was supposed to constitute a major step in that direction. However, on a capitalist basis, the attempt to create a rigid currency arrangement that was supposed to be equally applicable to economies as different as Germany and Greece was bound to fail. It could work as long as the boom lasted, but the advent of a slump has brought to the fore all the national contradictions and antagonisms. The euro is not the cause of the crisis of European capitalism, but it has enormously exacerbated the problems, especially of the weaker economies. In the past, the Greek and Italian governments could partially get out of trouble by devaluing the currency. Now this route is barred to them. The only alternative is what they now refer to as internal devaluation. As products cannot gain competitiveness through the devaluation of the currency, wages must be driven down instead. This means a regime of permanent austerity and attacks on living standards. The main factor for the imbalances in the European Union are the different strengths of the productive sector. Through the European Union, Greece was forced to change and become a country of services. We would be the waitresses of Europe, you know, to wait on tourists. That would be our fate. We had sectors of economy, of, of production and factories, that were very, very good and they had developed for, for years and they had experience and they had, and they shut it down because they, they were not um, competitive anymore. This competition thing, they were not competitive. So we were left, no, um, the farming sector was going down the drain because the, the, the guidelines were given by the U European Union, Everything was, you know, planned by the European Union. The main source of success of Germany is its position on the world market of industrial goods. It used perfectly the lowering of the interest rates in the southern European countries that followed the establishment of the Eurozone. Basically, it exported industrial goods and financed the export 
through giving credits to the buyers of its goods at the same time. This led to an uneven development of the current accounts of the European nations. In 1998, the balance of Germany's current account was minus 0.6% of the GDP, but it managed to increase this to plus 6.1% in 2010. That means that Germany's income by exporting goods and services is greater than what it spends on imports. At the same time, the balance of the Greek current account fell from minus 3.2 to minus 12.1% of the GDP in the same period. Money was coming in from the European Union. The European Union wanted Greeks to have money to buy their products or the BMWs or the, I don't know, the arms and the ships and the submarines and everything and everything. So we were given money. They knew that we didn't handle it correctly. They didn't intervene when it's, they should, okay? And all of a sudden we were flat on our backs. And they could see it coming, they didn't stop it. And then they found this guinea pig, Greece, to, uh, you know, to apply a new model of um, neoliberal change. The German bourgeoisie used the pre-crisis period to strengthen its position on the world market and invest in its productive capacity. It could only achieve this through massively casualizing its own labor market in order to lower labour costs. On a world scale, Germany is now the second biggest exporter after China. However, the same policies that the German bourgeoisie is implementing through the Troika in southern Europe is undermining its own export market. There have already been reports that German exports fell as it delivered less to its Eurozone neighbours. Europeans should waken up. Because it will, if the South goes down, and we will all go down, see what happens in Portugal, in Spain, Italy, Italy's debt, public debt, is ex exceeding two trillion. So when the South goes down, the rest of Europe will suffer as well. <laughs> Italy's public debt constitutes almost a quarter of the total debt in the Eurozone. We got curious about this startling figure and went to Milan. There we spoke to Claudio Bellotti, who wrote a book with the Italian title Crisi, Debito, Default, Rompere con l'Utopia, which in English means Crisis, Debt, Default, Break with the Utopia. What we see almost everywhere, certainly in Greece, in Italy, but also in Spain and Germany, is that uh, the existing political system, the existing political parties, both uh, on the right and uh, the so-called reformist party, I mean, the socialist parties, the social democratic parties, or the democratic party in Italy, all these try to, to, to cling together, to, to come closer to each other, because uh, they, they are all, um, so they, they, are, they are called by the ruling class to fulfill their national duty, as they put it. It is to save the, what they call the nation, which means to save their banks, their enterprises, their, uh, and their money, basically. And uh, it's uh, almost like a, a, a war coalition. The Italian Prime Minister Monti said we are at war and he said we are at war to save Italy to stay in the Euro but what they actually mean is we are at war against the people, against the workers, against the pensioners, against the youth uh, in order to, to withdraw every single reform and every single uh, element of the welfare state, uh, of uh, uh, social reform, reforms uh, which were uh, conquered in the, in the past through, through very, very hard uh, struggles. The terminology, the propaganda, the ideas was precisely a war propaganda. We must uh, pay back the debt. We lived uh, above our uh, possibilities, and, uh, which is quite fun to be, to 
he told by people who work for Goldman Sachs for hundreds of thousands of euros or dollars uh, wage uh, every year. Basically, we had uh, two main positions in the political debate. Uh, the government said uh, we must uh, pay full stop and therefore every measure is justified for that. And uh, the centre-left and also the trade union leaders who said, well, we accept the idea that the debt must be repaid, of course, we must be serious, as they say, we must do our homeworks, <laughs> but uh, we would like to have it uh, done in a, how do you say, uh, more human way, more uh, with more equality, the rich people should also pay something and we should not destroy the economy by repaying the debt. And, but it was it, basically it was just noise because after after all they voted in, they, they, they voted everything in parliament and as far as the trade union leaders they did absolutely nothing to to, to stop these measures particularly the counter reform of the pensions which was very very uh, hard and came on top of 20 years of gradual counter reforms. Italy has seen a number of huge demonstrations and strikes against those austerity measures in the last few years. The workers and youth fought a courageous fight against the measures of the government. But as in Greece, also in Italy, general strikes became a tool of the bureaucracy and the trade union leadership to let off steam without changing anything substantially. The politically advanced layers tried to find a way out of this situation. When uh, in some sectors of the left, of the trade union left, of uh, more left-wing forces, including the Refondazione uh, Comunista and other forces, uh, uh, a debate came out on the question, is it, is it uh, really necessary and correct that we assume we have to pay for this debt? We thought it was a, a step forward because uh, it was uh, in a situation of national unity, of uh, uh, Union Sacre, uh, at, at last someone began to say, well, uh, we shouldn't be paying. The workers, the pensioners, the, the youth shouldn't be paying for that. In 2012, the Comitato Nord Debito, the No Debt Committee, was formed. It is an umbrella body bringing together several organizations. Although it is not a mass movement, it was thanks to them that the first nationwide protests took place against the former National Unity Government, headed by Mario Monti. Uh, of course, the idea that the working class must not pay for the crisis is absolutely correct. Uh, but this doesn't just uh, reduce itself to the idea of default. Because the, some radical economists uh, put the forward idea that the point is the states must have the right to default like a private enterprise or like a, a family when uh, they cannot uh, repay their debts. And uh, seems that they, they seems that this idea was very very clever, very very attractive. But as a matter of fact, uh, the question of the national debt is just one aspect, one manifestation of the crisis, if you like. And uh, to default can uh, mean many different things. Uh, in, in many revolutions in history, debt, debts were not repaid, of course, starting from the Russian Revolution, the French Revolution, and, uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, in itself, the idea of default was uh, bent to uh, another meaning, that is, that uh, could be enough to avoid the worst consequence of the crisis without questioning the system as a whole. The supporters of the Marxist tendency of Falce Martello have been part of the Comitato Non Debito from day one. They put forward their ideas in the committee in order to deepen people's understanding about the real cause of the crisis and what should be done with the debt. We, we led a, a polemics against this and other uh, superficial uh, analysis of the nature of the crisis, because at, at, the, at the end, at the, at the, if you look at the, the very essential point, all these analyses start, have a common starting point, although they don't, do not declare it open sometimes. That is that you can separate finance or finance capital from capitalism in general. 
or that you can have a good finance and bad finance and you must just fight the bad finance, the speculations and so on and to, to save the, the good finance. This is uh, pure Keynesianism, both from a theoretical and a practical point, uh, point of view. And, uh, and I, I think that this is, not, this is linked to uh, uh, the dream that we can some way go back to the 60s or to the 50s to the so-called uh, golden age of the post-war boom and of uh, Keynesian policies. But the fact that the public debt in the G20 economies has been increasing since the mid-1970s is precisely an expression that this golden age came to an end many decades ago. The mechanism of the public debt is, like credit, an integral part of the functioning of the capitalist system. As it is not possible to separate finance capital and industrial capital, it is not possible to separate justifiable from unjustifiable debt as the proposal for an audit to review the debt suggests. It is an attempt which tries to cherry-pick the positive sides of capitalism and reject the bad things, whereas in reality they are two sides of the same coin. There has been a sort of campaign saying the point is to build committees to review the origin of a national debt to see which part of it, of it should be repaid, which part should not be repaid, and so on, which is uh, basically a nonsense. It's a waste of time, as a matter of fact. Uh, the point is not to enlighten the people on their misery. The people know very well that the situation is becoming miserable. The point is to indicate how to organize the necessary strength to uh, uh, resist and to overthrow these governments which are now uh, putting forward basically all the same policies. The mechanism of public debt has become the means whereby a few big moneylenders are making a lot of money due to returns from interest on the debt. And paying back this debt at all costs is now sacrificing the living standards of entire nations. The idea that the solution is to refuse to pay the debt or some parts of the debt while remaining within the Eurozone or capitalism in general is typical of utopian ideas. First of all, Within the system, the creditors have legally attested rights to their returns, even if a particular contract is considered immoral by some. An ethical viewpoint will take us no step forward. A state which does not pay back its debt would feel the combined wrath of the international capitalist class. And secondly, no creditor would ever give any money to a state which refuses to pay back its debt which raises the question of how the state would continue to finance itself. Such a step can only be linked to an explanation of the general functioning of the capitalist system and the overcoming of the same. It would bluntly state the question of power and has therefore revolutionary implications. In our opinion, this is exactly on the order of the day. When you look around today, it is becoming clearer that the system offers no way out. In one country after another, the crisis is deepening. In every country, the bourgeoisie is trying to restore economic equilibrium, but at the same time is therefore destroying the social and political equilibrium, not only in Europe. It is a worldwide crisis that has worldwide revolutionary implications. In the last decade, Latin America was the hotspot for revolutionary mass movements. It was replaced by the Arab world, where in the last few years we saw a number of revolutionary movements that toppled dictators, such as in Egypt or Tunisia. Inspired by these movements, people in southern Europe, in Greece, Spain or Portugal, took to the streets. Even in the US we saw the inspiring Occupy movement or the anti-austerity demonstrations in Wisconsin. What's more, some of the so-called emerging economies like Turkey and Brazil have been shaken by mass movements. For humankind to get out of this miserable situation, the first step would be a left government coming to power in one country. A, a left-wing government in a position like Greece or like Italy or Spain should, uh, should advance some, uh, some very clear points. First of all, the, the, the rejection of these austerity plans, we are not prepared to, 
to pay one more cent from pensions or from the state uh, education or from welfare in general. Another po important point is the question of uh, unemployment, which is exploding everywhere, and therefore the question of a real and serious reduction of the working week and also of the working life, because every, everywhere they are, they are forcing people to work for longer, long, not, 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 not only longer hours, but longer years in, in their life. Another thing that will be done through a left government is to stop um, destroying and, and selling the property of the public sector. It will stop and we'll try to gain back whatever has been given. We will have a strong social state, meaning that we have to work hard for uh, the health system and the education system. The money will go there. The money won't go to the lenders. They should know that. There's also the need of, uh, of the Syrian leadership to be clear about cancelling the Greek the, the debt of the Greek state, and uh, because it's a question of either you close the hospitals and you stop giving medicine to the pensioners and the sick people or you cancel the debt. There's no other choice. There's no third option. These sort of points, uh, which are not the solution, but measures of initial self-defense in order to uh, avoid this catastrophe which is uh, impending upon us. The, the idea is not just a question of to pay or not to pay back uh, this debt or part of it, but to take uh, control of all the resources they have, which, which are uh, absolutely needed. This crisis uh, is a, a huge shock for the youth and the working class. And that's, that, that, that has an effect in, in people's conscious, consciousness, what they believe about their lives, about society. Uh, if, if you ask an ordinary man or a woman, uh, if you put forward the question, what do you think that should, should happen in Greece? And if you ask him, do you really believe that uh, a revolution should, should take place, should, should take place in Greece? They will say, yes, we need a revolution. Maybe they don't understand what that means, or what, what does a revolution mean, or how will it be? But this reflects the consciousness of the, of the, of the people that they have realized that very, very serious things must, must change in order to, better, to make their lives better. In this, uh, this deep crisis that Greek capitalism faces, uh, there, there, there can be no, no real reforms, uh, not even a, a slight uh, rise of the wages. Uh, without, uh, without measures, without steps, that, uh, that uh, clash with the, with the limits of the capitalist uh, system of production. What it needs to be done is for the, the working class and the poor coming actually to power. It can be, be actually realized by a revolutionary and uh, radical party and a radical program in order to give these workers an actual plan. And by plan I mean a planned economy. You know there is so much wealth in the society that's just being uh, being um, used by very few people, while others search in the garbage in order to find some food. Uh, workers' control should be, be established by law. Every, in every company, in every factory, workers can uh, use this, uh, this right. Because after all, what we saw in, and what we are witnessing now in, in Spain, in Greece, in France, is that uh, despite uh, all the things they said for, two, for 30 years, not only the working class still exists, but it's, it's still the, the, the force which can rally all the other oppressed layers in society in, in, a, in, a, in a struggle for a real change, for a, for a, for a change of the system. The radical stuff will be the banks. The banks will be put under public control. The, the, the very same minute.
Why should we, the ordinary people, the working class, the middle class, the old age pensioner, the sick, why should we, who have least money, be subsidizing the banks for failure? Surely what ought to be done is that they should be nationalized, I would say nationalized, without a single cent of compensation. They should be made to pay money back. What do you mean compensation? When they've robbed us for decades, you know? It should be nationalized uh, under democratic workers' control without compensation. The banks and the finance houses and the big industries also, such that we could plan the economy with a planned economy, a democratic, a rationally planned economy, that's the only way really we, we, we can get the economy moving again. Because on the basis of capitalism, and by the way, they've admitted this, at least in Britain they admitted it. They've said the other day, it was on the, on the news, there is no way in which the middle and low income people in this country, and that goes for all other countries as well, they cannot even begin to recover their purchasing power until the year, what was it, 2024. Another 10 years, in other words, of falling living standards because the capitalist system does not work. Now, this, of course, uh, to me seems, uh, apart from immoral, it seems to me to be highly irrational. Why shouldn't it be possible to plan the economy? I mean, I mean every time I go into a supermarket, one of these big supermarkets like Tesco, I'm surprised. I don't know. Tesco can, can, can plan in such a way that they know exactly how many loaves of bread are needed in this area. And it's a big area. Exactly how much milk is needed. Exactly how many tins of beans are, are needed. They know exactly. You know. Well, if, 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 you can, if you can have that degree of planning within the, in a supermarket, why can't you have it for the whole of society? Of course you can. It's entirely possible on one condition that the basic levers of economic uh, control are in our, in our hands, in public hands. In the hands of the state, if you like, yes. Am I in favour of state uh, control? Well, of course I am, on one condition. The uh, industry and the banks must be in the hands of the state, but the state must be in the hands of the working class. We're in favour of complete democracy. You see, with a planned economy, it would easily be possible to reduce the working day, not to 30 hours, but to 20 hours a week, and increase production. You know, how would you do this? Well, look, isn't it absurd that you've got millions of people unemployed, while those who remain at work are working longer hours than ever before? Isn't that absurd? What we would say is, if, the, if there's unemployment, share the work. Let everybody work and work less hours. So therefore, as long as, as long as the profit motive is what decides, then you will never get a satisfactory human existence. What we would say is that the introduction of modern machinery and technology, which we're in favor of, should serve to reduce the working day to a minimum expression, thereby freeing people to develop themselves physically, mentally, intellectually, spiritually, if you like. To give people that, mo that, that most precious of commodities, which is a spare time. As Ar Aristotle explained that 2,300 years ago, when he said in the Metaphysics, man begins to philosophize when the needs of life are provided. That's the real meaning of socialism. When Engels said that socialism is, is mankind's leap from the realm of necessity to the realm of freedom. The only program that can give a solution to the working class, the socialist program, a program that uh, will put, uh, will organize the economy in a democratic way, and uh, of course a program that uh, cannot give solution only in a national limits, but in uh, only if it implies itself in the whole of Europe. So we say socialist uh, solution for Greece and the socialist solution for the whole of Europe. Well, Europe is an historically evolved entity. There is a European identity. Europe should be united. I mean, for too long, Europe has been the scene of wars and conflicts and senseless conflicts and barbarism. 
We're in favour of the unity of Europe. Yes, but on a capitalist basis, that is not possible. The whole experience of uh, the European Union demonstrates that. And by the way, it's entirely possible, in my view, that the euro will collapse. It's entirely possible. Not certain, because they might just manage to pull things together. But it will, will, will not survive in its old form anyway. And in any case, uh, the whole thing is, is breaking down. Far from eliminating nationalism and chauvinism and racism, they've enormously increased. If the Greek workers were to take power, let's say if Syriza, if Tsipras had a, a socialist policy, a genuine socialist policy, would take power in Greece and then appeal to the workers of Spain, of Italy and France to follow his example, as Lenin and Trotsky did in the time of the Bolshevik Revolution. Just think of the impact that that would have. I think it would have a far bigger impact on people's minds than the Russian Revolution of 1917. And therefore, it would be possible to, to unify Europe on the basis of a common socialist plan of production, which would pool the resources. Now, just imagine that. Europe has got huge resources, not just, not just of industry, but agriculture, which they can't use. The, this crisis is so big that when you come out of it and look back, you will realize that you can never go back. To, to, you know, this, this cruelty and this barbarism of capitalism, you will realize that. But people have to see with their own eyes. Humankind is now uh, in a turning point in which we have to decide. People have to make their minds up that uh, it is necessary to put an end to this system which has outlived its usefulness, which is completely senile, reactionary, retrograde and so on, and take into their hands the running of society. Yes, but that presupposes a serious struggle. One can say that uh, at the present time, the old society is dying on its feet. The new society is struggling to be born. Yes, but that can be quite a painful and prolonged process. It is therefore up to us, up to the Marxist, to do everything in our power to shorten this uh, process to make it less painful, to make it less difficult. And the way that one does that is by fighting within the organizations of the working class for the only program and policy that can succeed. That is to say, the ideas of Marxism, the marvelous ideas, the profound ideas of scientific socialism, which were worked out over 150 years ago and which have never been more relevant than at the present time. And therefore, in conclusion, I would like to appeal to all of you, to the workers, the youth in particular, to assist us in the building of a Marxist alternative, to help us in the building of the international Marxist tendency, and to participate in the only cause which is worthwhile to sacrifice and struggle for in the 21st century, that is to say, the sacred cause for the emancipation of the working class and the victory of socialism on a world scale.